So here we are, and uh, my guest today, I'm happy to say, is Eamon McDermott from Derry. Welcome, Eamon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk to you, Eamon, about your, your, your life and the many things that have happened in the course of your life. It certainly was an eventful life, I think it'd be fair to say. Um, you're from Derry, of course. Did you grow up in Derry? You did, yeah? Oh, yes, as they say, born and reared here. We grew up from, like, my father was actually born in Bonkrana. And done it all, but sure. that, yeah, but that's a, an interesting story in itself. And that his mother was a teacher in the Long Tower School here in Derry. And when come partition, teachers who were classed as civil servants were told they had to take the oath of allegiance. And my grandmother, being a Republican, refused to take it and was then subsequently told you're no longer allowed to teach in the north. So she had to move to Bunkrana to find work as a teacher. So, I mean, it just shows you the sort of realities of partition are not simply a line on the map, like a lot more than that. Oh, I, I certainly for Derry. In the short time that I taught in Derry, I lived in Donegal myself across the border. Um, so, were you from a big family, Eamon? Yes, we were. Uh, there was eight siblings, seven, I have seven boys and one girl. So, and where did you or, come? I am the third oldest. I've got a brother and a sister above me. Mm -hmm. Had that much of an effect, do you think, have been in that position? Were you one of the, the ones that told people what to do rather than was told in turn what to do? Well, I think being a big family, you sort of it gives you responsibility very early on because you're looking after the ones below you. Like, because, you know, the best one in the world, my mother couldn't have looked after eight of us. So you're drafted in to look after the younger ones. And so you have responsibility. You have, it sort of gives you that idea that you know you, you don't just look after yourself you have to look after others as well uh, uh, good good and uh, values have instilled um your father was uh, was a, a very, well you've mentioned the fact that your grandparents were republican was your, your father was republican too yes he was republican he was a, a doctor he's a gp here in the city and but he was a republican in this and the in that you could in those days the 50s 60s like he was involved with the GAA. He always instilled Republican values in us. I mean, I remember one that sticks out in my head was when I was doing the 11 plus, which in them days was called verbal reasoning, like an intelligence test. And we were doing the practice for it. And I was doing my homework at night in the house, doing a practice. And the, one of the questions was, true or false, Prince Charles is our next king. Nice. So I said to my father, true or false, is Prince Charles our next king? He says, false. That's right, okay. So I'm just going to the next day and mark wrong, which would be my annoyance. But uh, so that, that's the sort of, but it was, I mean, we always had, we were always a very sort of politicized family, even su stupid things like, you know, if you ever said the word the queen, the, the fall up with immediately had my mother, army father, be the queen of where? Queen of Sheba. Mm -hmm. No, we didn't have a queen. It was, you, you had to say the Queen of England or the British Queen. Oh, very good. Yeah, I, I, funny, I, I shouldn't go into it now, but there was a man, you, you probably knew him, uh, Frank P. Macaulay, the taught in the college. Yes. And he yes. used to take us through the, he taught me history, and he used to take us through the history book. The way he did it then was he'd read it out and he'd tell us to underline bits. But any time he came to an expression such as, um, uh, with our allies, we won the Second World War or whatever, he was a score, score that out. Stick out that arrow, put in <laughs> British, the way when the British and their allies yes. won the war, you know? Well, that's, it's my father would have been the same sort of thing. And uh, so we were brought up and politics was always part. We knew my grandfather, my grandfather was uh, one of the first people arrested in Derry after the 1916. He was interned in Frangog, he was interned in Bally Kindler. He was the time in Derry jail. And we were aware of his history, now he died Funnily enough, the day before I was born, and uh, but we so but we were aware of his history, and it wasn't something that wasn't talked about. It was I mean the Republican thing was always an, an aspect in our house. Mm -hmm. You you yourself joined the IRA. Did any of your siblings join the IRA? Not really, no, no. But they were all pretty politicized, but they didn't. None of them went that far. Yeah. What was it, Eamon, um, that prompted you when you see you had a Republican background? I can appreciate that would play a big part, but um, the fact is that uh, none of your siblings were actively involved in the conflict. <clears throat> and uh, by and large, and with honourable exceptions, the conflict was fought between working class people. Um, the, the middle class tended to go the SDLP route or, or, or just simply stay at home. Um, what was it that prompted you to 
take that step? And was it was it a scary one to take? Well, I started at the end first, and it wasn't scary as such, but what prompted me, it was a combination of factors. I mean, as I say, we were a very politicized house. We were, I mean, we were all involved, well, the older ones, the older children, my mother and father were all involved in the civil rights from day one, from the 5th of October. Yeah. And we have been involved in all the marches subsequently. My father ran uh, first aid posts around the bog during the Battle of the Bog Sides and on and the internment and everything else. So we were very much aware of what was going on around us. We were very much involved in what was going on around us. And it just comes a point, and I think where you, you know, you make a decision and it comes down to choices. And as you say, we were middle class. You know, you could have put your head down and say, we're not going to have anything to do with this. But it just wasn't in my nature. My nature was, if you're going to have, there's something going on, right? Either there's a war going on in your country, you have to take a side. So I took a side. Well, uh, they say that um, when people joined the IRA, they were told that, uh, or they knew themselves maybe, that the prospects uh, or where that they'd probably end up either having a long sentence in prison or dead. Well, I mean, was that not a daunting prospect? No, not at uh, 16. At 16, you're invincible. And the, the thing about joining the IRA is what people didn't understand, it was extremely difficult to do. You know, they really did try to persuade you not to join. And it wasn't like, it wasn't if they were welcoming you open arms. They made it very difficult to make sure that you were sure of what you want to do but they say at 16 you're invincible they're never going to catch me they're never going to shoot me and all the rest and that's the way you think and you, you know when you heard all that they did they stressed that continuously long time in jail or in the cemetery and all the rest and you just in the back you're going to ask that me they're talking about well at what age were you when you were arrested well the first time i was arrested i was 17. and where were you, were you um Put in prison for long or were you just arrested at least no no i was no the first time i was actually arrested i was 15 but the first time i was arrested for them i was caught with a gun in 1974 when i was 17 hmm. and i spent two years in jail then and got released in 1976. Mm -hmm. and and go ahead just just tell us your life from that point well then then uh i mean there was the conflict was still going on the ceasefire of 75 had ended the conflict was still going on, so I became, an, I became a Republican activist again. But the uh, this would turn into the, the period of Castle Ray interrogations and all the rest. And I was arrested in January 77 and made a confession that simply wasn't true, but you made it under duress. It was that's when they brought you into the police station, you know, they didn't care whether you were guilty or innocent, they didn't care whether you'd done what they were after you for, they were just more interested in getting. Statistics, people charged, people in court, people away to jail, and the, they didn't care. So I made a confession, went to jail, and subsequently spent 15 and a half years in the hits blocks. So what, could I ask you what, what you um, uh, said in that confession? I admitted to have been involved in the, or setting up a police up man that was shot in the place where I worked. That's what I said. Well, that, that's what they said in the confession. Mm -hmm. I just said. What, what are we working at then, by the way? I was just working. I was working. I was trying to get to university. After going to prison, I wanted to go to university. So I did my A-levels in 76 in a matter of months, but I only got one of them. And so uh, I said, I'll go, go again in the next year. And so I got a job just in a petrol station, serving petrol just to get a few pounds. Mm -hmm. And there's a policeman mm -hmm. shot in that garage. And so the cops put two and two together and figured it was me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so, so I signed for them. You were given a sentence of 17 years. No, I was given a sentence of life. I was given a life I, sentence. Yeah. How, was, how, what, how did you receive that? Like I said, how, were you scared of uh, joining the IRA? <laughs> were you scared of the prospect to spend the rest of your life in prison? Again, no, you see, I mean, my, the one thing, the one bedrock I always had was I was a Republican. I always believed that what Republicans were doing was right. And so therefore, when you got a life sentence, it was sort of this is what you expected them to do. You know, this is what they do. They give they deal Republicans. So it was daunting in some way. I was what I was got arrested was nineteen. I think it was twenty one by the time I the time I was sentenced. It was two years on remand. So it was daunting in one way. But you're more concentrated on the blanket protest, which was next in line because that was what happened to you when you were sentenced. Mm -hmm. And I was more focused on getting on the blanket and you know, surviving that than thinking about a life sentence. So did you spend time on the blanket? 
I spent almost three years in the blanket. What do, how, 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 when you think of that now, uh, is it horrible or do you feel proud of it? Or Well, I'm proud of it in the sense that, you know, I think it was, it was a, probably the, the hardest prison struggle ever undertaken in this, in this country, in, the, in history. I'm proud that I was part of that. Uh, I, if you ask me what I want to do it again, the answer would have to be no. But it was, um, it, looking at it from outside, it was horrendous, but you, it was your reality. So you, done, you took the conditions, you took the beatings, you took everything else that went on. And because uh, this is what we had to do, because you were never going to accept that the Republican struggle was a criminal struggle. And that's what was at stake. Mm -hmm. You say you took the beatings. Now, most people know there were beatings went on, but could you give me a description of um, how that would happen? Well, <clears throat> say I'll give you an answer. That because of the, the no wash protest, there was uh, three wings and a hitch block with four, four, there was three full wings and they would clean one wing. And when it was clean, then they would move a wing over to it. And it was called a wing shift. And on a wing shift, the way it would work would be They'd open your door early in the morning, eight o'clock, whatever, at half seven, you know what, so you didn't know, and say, right, out. Now, wing shifts could go several ways. You could get it that everything was quiet enough and thinking you just walked over. You went over the mirror. They had a mirror search, and they tried to bend you over the mirror. We refused to bend. You could get to maybe just a thing in the back of your legs, and then that was gone. That would be a fairly easy wing shift. Other wing shifts, you come out, whatever reason, could be whoever's in charge. It could have been whatever was happening outside. You could, as soon as the door opened, you were sort of like run the gauntlet of prison officers. And then when they got you with the mirror, bend, no. And the next thing you would be getting punched, kicked, jumped on and everything else. And then you'd be up and get, get up into the clean cell. So that was one example where you got beaten. There was other ones for just instance where uh, an individual prison officer or a group of prison officers could have been drunk, they could have been whatever, and they just decided to give, they could come into your cell. Uh, Any time there was an interaction between blanket men and prison officers, there was a risk of getting the beat. Was that, would you have been um, apprehensive that that was going to happen? Because if it happened frequently, you know, inside the next week, maybe you could expect to get a beating. Well, you, you were apprehensive the whole time. I mean, as soon as you heard your, a key in the door of your cell, you were immediately apprehensive because you didn't know what was going to what was going to happen. Say the, the safety was in the cell when the door was locked, and the screws were not in the wing. You were safe enough, but any time there was any sort of interaction to go on a visit, whatever, there was always a risk. So you were always apprehensive. Every time the door opened, you were apprehensive. See, you you spent uh, so you spent time on the blanket, uh, and then I suppose a hunger strike was something that would have absorbed you. Um, for somebody like myself, it's very hard to think how you could come out of 17 years in prison with your sanity. I, I, at least I doubt if I would anyway. You said I did. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I think jail and it be at the blanket, be it, I mean, you're talking about adjusting the life sentence. I mean, I would then, once I was sentenced, I had read two years done in remand. So on the blanket for nearly three and then we came off the blanket and it was readjusting the sort of normal life of clothes watching tv things like that and that was another year then we went into the system to and we had a whole the battle to get segregation to get no work and then we had the escape so this was 1983 the escape was so i was in jail almost seven years at that stage and hadn't even thought about my life sentence because of too much else going on so then you're talking about doing one thing settled down i think the way the, well, my, my own key was not to want what you couldn't get. You know, if I think if you lay in jail and you're sitting on a Saturday night going, oh, I should be in the embassy or I should be in the borderland or whatever, tearing your hair out, no, my mates are all out drinking there, chasing gear, you'd go insane. But if you just took it as, I'm here, let's make the most of it. I mean, I was always very fond of cigars, so I used to save my money and buy up seven cigars, <sighs> one for each night. And when the door locked at half eight, I would have a cup of coffee and cigar and maybe a good book. And that, to me, was as good as it's going to get. And I was quite happy with that. You know, if the proverbial Martian had landed down beside me and says, how do you feel at this exact moment? Well, I says, grand, fine. <laughs> and then on top of that, I did the Open University. I did a degree at the Open University. And that occupied your time because 
you you almost had to do that every day. Mm. So I would do that at night from nine to eleven. I would try and be religious about getting out mm. in open university, do the two hours, mm. then take a Saturday night off, mm. which give you a complete. Mm. And that started in February and finished in October. And as you know, with anything that with a deadline on it, it tends to make time go faster. Uh, uh, did you um, were you in much discussion with people who were a lot of the Republican prisoners did the open university? Would you have yeah. Had colleagues that are doing the same thing, and would you have talked to them about the work? Or oh, I we know we all we had we were I mean Republicans were very open about the benefits of education and discussions about about the stuff you were doing about other stuff about the war about politics. You know, we were continually discussing. We probably talked too much, but we that was no. You were very open about it. We were very open about education, and a lot of Republicans at the Open University did very well at it. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think it benefited you, besides the fact that it gave you something to do to occupy your mind? Well, it gave me a degree at the end of it. I, I got a first class honours degree out of it, and uh, so it gave Good me that. You. And Good for you. What, 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 were you. what did you study? Well, the way the Open University works is it's credit. You do a different, you do a credit every year. And so you could do, you start off social sciences, then we then do economics, did a bit of history. And then just for pure pleasure, I did a course on literature. Now, that was just for me because I I love literature, but it mostly economics, history, that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, I even did a science degree, which was our science course was uh, was quite funny because uh, they send you a science kit as part of the course, and I think I was allowed two things out of it, the rest was all banned by security. I was one of them was a wee molecular model, you know the we balls and the sticks and, you, and uh, then the first experiment they would give you these experiments and the first experiment was uh, get a bunch of keys <laughs> and the second experiment was go out at night and measure the moon or something of a thing and I go, again kind of difficult so there was challenges to that sort of course yeah yeah we, 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 what I'm wondering is uh, given the fact that a lot of uh, Republicans particularly did study open university, would you have had a chance to talk about the work with, with people who are doing the same course as you, or were you always working in, as an individual? No, we, uh, unless somebody in the wing was doing the same course as you. But if you're talking about in the classes, no, you got a tutor. A tutor came in once a month from outside, and uh, they would come in and you would discuss your essays, you would discuss any problems. I mean, you got about a, an hour, I think it was an hour, an hour and a half, maybe every month. And then there was a, an organizer, a coordinator for the Open University who was, she was around all the time. She would come in and she was the one you would, if you didn't get some part of your course or if you were, you know, if you had any problems. But you generally, unless somebody in your wing was doing the exact same course, you wouldn't have had any opportunity to, to talk about it. Did you enjoy those courses? <laughs> the enjoy the Open University? The visits, yeah. Particularly well, the, visit, the visits, oh. exchanges. Well, some of them were, I, but, some of them were quite funny because a lot of the tutors would come in feeling very intimidated. Mm. You, mm. you, you had eight visits a year from an outside tutor, and it usually took about the fourth visit before they came down. You don't realize you, you weren't going to. How, how could you tell that they were agitated? What would they do? They would be sitting there nervous, very jittery. And I see a lot of it too. You'd be, they'd, you go out to a classroom, but the door of the classroom would be locked. And a lot of people have been locked in. It was a very alien concept. They also didn't mean anything, but to the tutors, and you'd see they'd be very on age, they'd be very jumpy, and sort of took them a long time to relax and get into the, the swing of things. And we always tried our best, like we'd bring them out coffee and we'd chat. And, you know, but I think it just took a while to realize that you know we hadn't got two heads and we weren't going to bite them. So it's an interesting sort of turnaround to see the opposite way to usually, you know, the, the teacher is usually calming down the student. But yeah, you know, well, I mean, the whole issue, the whole thing of jail with the Republicans was the opposite of the way it would be. I mean, jail is designed to dehumanize. You know, that you're a number, you're not a person mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. So whenever we came off the blanket, we decided, no, well, this is no good. So we started humanizing us ourselves so that we would go up, we would talk to the screws, we would even end up helping them with their crosswords and different things. So it got the stage. When they would go out and a governor would say, right, go down that wing and do X, Y, and Z. Well, I mean, my nickname in jail was Doc, after my father, Doc. And uh, so, but when the screw's head, it's not going down there and do that uh, one, one, one McDermott. It's, geez, I can't do that to Doc. No, 
talk to my friends, talk mm. to my girlfriends with me. So once we got them to see us as humans, the system doesn't work. And we had a fair degree of freedom. Now, within the boundaries have been locked in and the, the, the wings, the either end of the wing being secure. But within the wing, we were able to get them to relax and let leave girls open that we could go in out of the canteen and sit at us and things like that. So it was, it was turning the whole jail thing around rather than them dehumanizing us. We humanized ourselves and forced them to, to see us as humans. Was that a conscious decision of the Republican organizers in prison or was it individuals just that? No, no, it was a conscious thing. We did, we deliberately decided to move forward this way to try and get the wing, the conditions that we wanted as best we could. And it wasn't that, I mean, they used to accuse us of reading psychology, you know, which we didn't, but we, there were a lot of psychology in it, but they didn't know that. You know, we could ramp it up and turn it down when it suited us. And if uh, something happened that we decided, we would say, right, right, lads, tomorrow morning, ramp it up. But we would be very much in control. They didn't realize that. But we were totally in control of it, that nobody was going to, we say, right, ramp it up and don't touch anybody. So the next morning, you'd be growling and roaring. And they'd be terrified. But they were safe as houses because we had, we, you know, we made the decision they weren't going to get touched. And they weren't going to get touched. The Republicans were very, very disciplined. Were the, were the screws not pretty tough guys themselves? Uh, they weren't as tough as us. Hmm? <laughs> they weren't as tough as us. Well, they, well, they, they were. They thought they were, but they, see, during the blankets, it had been all one-way traffic. They were total control. They had, like, it was easy to beat naked men, and a lot of them did. So at the end of the blanket, we made a thing. We said, right, basically, here's the crack. We're not going to hold you all accountable for what you did during the blanket, provided you don't mess us about now. But if you come down our wing and you're an ex blanket screw and you come down our wings and start messing about, well, then you are going to be held accountable. So a lot of them say, you see, was... I mean, you said held accountable. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, battered. I mean, they battered us. If we had got our hands on some of them, we may have, been, they, we may have wanted to batter them back. Did you not do that? For, you have to, you have, sure, you have to actually occasionally follow through rather than just sort of have the threat of uh, fighting back. Well, that was the point. We we did. There was the occasional time we did follow through. There was a, one or two screws got thumped, but generally, the most of them down the wing behaved themselves, and that's the way that was okay. Then we accepted them. Now there were some of the really bad ones that would never set foot in our wings again because I think it would have been too difficult for even ourselves to control it. Mm. So uh, some of them, a lot, some of them didn't come down the wing at all. But then the other screws, I mean, they worked out very quickly. It was in their interest to keep us happy. Mm -hmm. you know, it meant their job was easier. They were not, number one, they weren't at any risk. Number two, our, the Republican wings were well run when the OC said something that that was it. So they didn't have to worry about, uh, I, you know, if the OC says that's okay, it was okay. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, so the way you talk about it, uh, it seems to me, do you tell me if I've got this right? Uh, the 17 years for you were bearable in part because they were divided into sections. There was the time of the blanket and then there was the time of the escape and then there was the time of the hunger strike. That it was sections of the 17 years that you went through that made it bearable. And the other thing presumably that made it bearable was the fact that you were doing it along with people that saw life and politics the way you saw it. Yeah, well, that was a big fact. I mean, they've all, I mean, I've seen studies that said that in Republican prison, we had a very straightforward view of the world. The Republican struggle was against the British. The British were locking us up. The guys closing the door at night had a crown on their hat. So that was okay. That was the enemy. They were, you know, you didn't expect anything else off them. Apparently, loyalists had a lot tougher time because they were fighting for Britain. Yet this guy with a crown in his hat was locking them up. So we didn't have that struggle. We didn't, to us, it was quite straightforward. We didn't expect the enemy to do anything different. And this is what they did. So we could live with that. We could accept that they're going to lock up Republicans. They're going to try and undermine Republicans. I mean, the whole blanket thing was about undermining the Republican struggle. Mm -hmm. So to us, the time in jail was an extension of the struggle outside just. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um when did you know that the, your time in prison was coming to an end? Did you get it in 1998? No, I got it in 1992. 92. How, 92. how come? 
Well, what happened was that after, I mean, they were end up in this situation where they had an awful lot of prisoners doing an awful long time. And I think even the British began to think, well, we can't have this. So I think about, I can't remember the exact chronology, but we started cooperating with what was called the Life Sentence Review Board. For years, we had nothing to do with it. So at, at the they did a review anyway, whether you cooperated or not. So at my 10-year review, I was told you got I got the maximum knockback, which was another five years. So in 1987, I was called out. The governor says, here, and they hand you a bit of paper saying, the Life Sentence Review Board has reviewed your case. They will review it again in 1982. So that was all right. Fair enough. So then they think the political pressure was beginning to tell the British, and they thought, right, we better do something. So they started, I think they started encouraging the Life Centre Review Board to start releasing prisoners. So we started cooperating with slightly. You know, the one thing, I mean, the, I mean, I was granted and wasn't worried about admitting anything because I had nothing to admit. But I mean, Republicans just, we did not admit any, there's any crime involved or any sort of mm -hmm. you know, remorse involved. Mm -hmm. That was always a problem for the Life Centre Review Board because that's, sort yeah. of the, the basic point they want the prisoners but so then they just decide right we're going to have to start letting them go so my review was coming up 1992 and uh quite unexpectedly to be honest they sent me for me and i thought right, this is another knockback for whatever and they says the rights on review board has recommended you should be released mm -hmm. and then there's a process goes through they have to go to the judiciary who have to pass it and then it goes to the secretary of state and it takes about I think about six months. So from the whatever it was February, March '92, I was knew that they were concerned. Now they could come to the end of that conclusion and say, "No, we're not going to let you out," but you knew there was a chance. And as part of that, then I applied to McGee to do a master's in peace and conflict studies, which I thought was rather apt. But uh, I was accepted by McGee. Now that actually worked to my benefit because in August they decided. They told me that I decided to be released. And normally there was a scheme called the workout scheme, which they did from McGabry, which you went out to work on a Monday morning in Belfast. And you went back to jail Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. And then when you went out to, on a Friday, you stayed out for the weekend mm -hmm. and started working on a Monday. And that usually lasted three, four months. But because McGee accepted me, they said, right, you can go straight to McGee. So I just got straight release and it wasn't uh, any work out. It was uh, out and that was me because Miggy had accepted me. How, how, was it, what, how did you feel about uh, going back into the world? Well, we got, they started a scheme in 1990. Anyone with over 13 years done got parole in the summer and parole at Christmas. So my first time actually out to the world was in summer of 1990. And how long have you served then, Eamon? How long have you been in uh, prison? About 13 and a half years. God, listen. Around. Huh? So, what was, what, how did that feel? Like, were, were you, they always say that uh, people are they're very fearful uh, moving in open spaces and uh, traffic and all sorts of things like that that everybody who's outside takes for granted. Well, there was a lot of factors. I mean, number one, you mentioned traffic. You had no concept. You don't realise just how much, just because you do it every day, you judge the speed of a car of thing. You had no concept of that. You nearly all nearly got knocked down to the start because you didn't know what thing. Another thing that people, uneven surfaces. Jail's very flat. It's all co concrete and tarmac. Very flat. See, walking along a pavement with its ups and downs. I think I was near breaking my neck for about six months <laughs> trying to think. So because you just simply weren't used to it. Stairs, you, know, you didn't go up and down stairs on a regular basis. The blocks are all flat. So things, small things like that were all they, they're not insurmountable, but the first couple of days was really, I mean, your adrenaline is pumping. You sleep for about two hours mm. because you're almost like, you don't want to miss anything. You only got four days, so you, you don't want to miss anything. And my brothers on the, on the first night took me to a disco in Derry, which was sort of like a culture shock. It was always like, God, take me back to my cell, please. This is, <laughs> but... But you adjust, you adjust. Yeah. What was the best part, Eamon, of coming out? Why, I mean, sometimes it's small stuff and sometimes it's big things. Was it seeing relatives? Was it uh, looking at an open fire or what was it? I think the best part, apart from the fact of meeting my wife and getting married and all that, uh, but that, that was all great. But no, the best part I think was watching my parents and watching sort of the, the worry and stress that they've had for all the time I was in jail, sort of, 
rubbing, running off them as the sort of he's out now. You know, because I'm sure there was times they thought they would never, they would never live to see me uh, mm-hmm. getting out. So I think that was very, very important. Was getting out, looking at them, watching them, watching their reaction, and knowing that they were saying, "Oh, thank God, he's out now," and the family was complete for well, for a short time. But that's our story. You didn't feel you didn't feel when you were in prison. You, you didn't think about the effects on them of your being in prison? Of course you did. You were always kind. I mean, that was, I used to say, the visits were the greatest falsehood of both sides because they would come up pretending they weren't worried. And I would go out in the visit pretending I was grand. And even seeing the blanket, oh, I'm fine. And it was, it was pure funny. I mean, I would never show them. I would never go out to them and say, oh, Jesus, this is terrible. Or I've got this or I'm worried about that. You wouldn't have done it. But then vice versa, they wouldn't have done it to me either. Yeah. So both of us were putting on a false face. Yeah. You know, but you yeah. were very conscious that while, while I was in jail that it was taking a lot out of them. Yeah. Were they proud of you? They were. Yes, they were. You know, they my one thing I'd say my family were always great standing by me. You know, they were never uh, very, very proud and very sort of my mother and father were both involved in the Hitch Blocks campaigns. Most of my all my brothers would have been as well. And so no it, there was none of this here, like the usual middle class thing of sort of, oh, we say nothing, we don't let on. So they were quite, I mean, if you didn't, couldn't accept the fact that they had a son in prison, you wouldn't have stayed a friend of theirs for that long. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did your time in prison scar you in any way? I would like to say no. And well, that's, I mean, no, I don't, I don't have any sort of hang ups or my, my wife probably tell you she uh, it did, but I don't agree with her. But anyway, no, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think. I mean, it's it's party. I think it's it's. I hit to the old cliche, but whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But it's the same idea that no, you come through it. I come out. I'm here now. I'm happily married. I've got a couple of children and all the rest. So, don't don't look back and say, oh look, well, per me, what's the point? Mm-hmm. Are you, you, well, on the other hand, are you when you look back in your life, are you proud of what way your life was compared to many other people? As I said, by and large, middle class people didn't get involved in the conflict. Uh, you did, and you paid a price for that. Uh, you know, big chunk of your life behind bars. Did you feel a degree of uh, well? There's a life that was a hard one, but you lived it according to certain beliefs. I that's I feel it. I mean, it was my life. It was the way it worked out. I mean, I. If you ask me, do you want, would you rather you weren't, hadn't been arrested? I, but I was. So therefore you live it as it, as you find it. So I um, would I love to have my twenties back when you're in that carefree stage before your mortgage and work and all that. Yeah, I'd love that, but it's not going to happen. So there's no point. I don't believe in regrets and looking back and saying, you know, oh, I should have done this or I wish I'd done that. It's your life. You live it and it's all part of the experience. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason I'm asking that is because yours is so sort of, well, when you describe to me the, the fact that your family, going back to your grandparents, were very Republican, that sense, I can see how that fits in. But as a middle class young fella, you would be very atypical. You know, you wouldn't have been like those around you uh, or from a similar background, surely. No, no, I, I wouldn't have been. I mean, I, I went to St. Columns College hmm. of Fame, and uh, I mean, I don't think I was the first person arrested out of the school, but I've been close to the first. Hmm. And uh, I think the school it was very quite funny. They they offered me an academic reference when I got out in 1976, but no character reference, which is one without the others. Like, <laughs> but uh, so no, it wouldn't have been that. It wouldn't have been atypical. But I mean, I was never a typical. I mean, my, our parents brought us up to be very egalitarian. You no, know, they wouldn't would have killed us if they had a Harris Express. I think it would have been seen as looking down anybody or any sort of mm-hmm. snobbishness or anything else. Yeah. You no, know, so we followed it. We and so it wouldn't have been atypical. A lot of a lot of people that would have been to school with me would some of them were probably horrified, but sure. So what? Uh, it didn't lead to the ending of any friendships. The fact that you got involved uh, as, as much as you well, it, it ended well. F- and in their friendships, I mean, I wouldn't be very friendly with most people I was to school with mm. now. But were they not quite that. important at that time? Like, I, I remember when I was 16 or 17, God, you know, I thought I'd be friends with these guys forever. And the thought of, you know, going off even and having any breach in that kind of friendship, it seemed something I would have gone out of my way to avoid. Yeah, but the thing that was when I got out in 1982, like it was a period of 15 years had passed. 
I mean, what friendships would have been, or most of the friendships would have just have died. And anyway, I would still meet them. I would still be friendly in the sense that we would chat and we meet mm -hmm. and things like that. But, you know, they had gone off and built the life and were probably married and halfway their career, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I was coming out to live. And so the friendships that wouldn't have survived that anyway. So, mm -hmm. no, I, I wouldn't. I don't know. I mean, maybe some people don't particularly like me because of what I was doing, but that's. <laughs> I wasn't aware of it, so it didn't yeah. matter. Yeah, none of them crossed the street when they'd see you come. <laughs> no, to be honest, I no, I can't think. I mean, you see, Derry's a very strange, not a strange time, but Derry's, I mean, people who would be never be Republicans in a million years, but they would meet me after I got out. Oh, Zach, came it great to see you. And you no, know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Derry wouldn't, because I think, you know, a lot of people would have felt, regardless of what's, whether they agree or disagree with what I was doing or had done or didn't do or whatever. You know, I'm still in McDermott, still the doctor's son. And mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of people who would have stayed, you know, I say would never have been Republican, never will be Republican, but they would still be friendly with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You appealed your case um, and were successful. Uh, have I got that right? Joe yeah, well, we didn't. Barrister. Well, Joe was, uh, Joe was our junior, yes. Right, tell, us, tell us about that. Well, we see the after the Guildford Four and the Birmingham Six, the British government set up a thing called the, I think it's called the Criminal Cases Review Commission, to avoid miscarriage of justices, as they said. So, about two thousand, but around about two thousand, maybe two thousand and one, uh, uh, some solicitors got a load of ex prisoners together and says, look, there's possibility we could look at some of this, see, as they call it, the CCRC sends cases off them and see what happens. So I didn't set a while out of it. You know, you, you, it's a pretty sure thing, but you didn't expect to get a while out of it. So uh, they selected a few cases and myself and Rim McCartney was charged along me. We were, we had a good case. We had fought our trial itself, had lasted 56 days. And we had had a hell of a fight to, to before they could convict us. So sister says, well, maybe this is a case that might, uh, might be worth it. So we sent it off to the CCRC. And then, to be honest, I forgot about it. You got a letter every year to say, uh, this from the CCRC saying, uh, your case is in a low, but we're very overloaded, blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't taking much notice of it. I wasn't expecting anything off it. It was just, it had been suggested, the sister says there's a possibility something could come out of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we based our initial case on a particular point. I can't even remember the point now. It's really much interest to check on it. But then at 2006, one morning, out of the blue, doorbell went at half seven in the morning. I'm supposed to have a package. And I mean, this was all, the, apart from the year later, I got this package, opened the package. It was from the CCRC saying your case has been referred to the Court of Appeal on a completely different ground than what we had appealed on. Mm -hmm. They had discovered, they went as part of their investigation, they had discovered a fact that one of the police officers, yeah, our defense was that we had been bad. It was duress. And of course, the, the court totally rejected that in 1979 or 78. So they discovered that one of the police officers involved in our case had been recommended for prosecution for one of the witnesses in our case, for battering one of the witnesses in our case. So what you draw is, you know, if he battered this man, you can't say he didn't battle the rest of them. Yeah, yeah. So they referred it on this point, which we, we weren't even aware of this. They had found it. So that was the start of it. Uh, it took about, I think, six or seven months to get to court. The hearing was in September 9th, or 2006. We had a, a hearing in the court. Now, Michael Mansfield represented me as a senior. So Joe, Joe was exaggerating when he said that he was your barrister? Well, no, Joe was my junior. <laughs> so he, he was the junior barrister. Yeah, Michael, yeah, Mansfield. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Michael Mansfield was uh, very, very good. Very, I think, an Irish oh, McDermott. Yeah, yeah. Lisa McDermott was representing Raymond, so we had a very formidable team. And uh, so the case went, now Michael Mansfield himself said, if this had been the Court of Appeal in London, the, the judges would have thrown it out day one. They just said to the prosecution, sit down, you've no case. But because it was here, they went through the motions, the prosecution went through the motions. Eilish and Michael Mansfield made their submissions, and that was it. And then it took another, I think it was, it was February 2007, Actually, funny enough, on my father's anniversary, the anniversary of my father's death, we got, uh, just before we were told, your judgments next week. So on the 15th of February, 2007, we went up and the court 
coerced everything. Do all that. So it only took them 30 years, which you know, for British justice is not too bad. <laughs> how did you how did you feel? Did you did you feel a certain sense of triumph after the long run? Or was it just, you know, it's not going to change anything in the past anyway? No, it wasn't going to change in the past, but there was a certain amount of triumph of saying, well, we told you so. Mm. You know, we, mm. we fought for 56 days to say we, we shouldn't be convicted of this and we've finally been proven right. So mm -hmm. there was a certain amount of that. There was a certain amount of not euphoria because we're sort of all along in the truth at that stage. But you, know, you were you were glad to be vindicated and say, you know. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was, the more political thing was that we were one of the first, I mean, we've always argued Diplock as a uh, system was never scrutinized properly. Yeah, yeah. As soon as it started getting scrutinized by an outside body, it was found wanting. Mm -hmm. And we were one of the first cases that it, that was scrutinized. And even one during our appeal, one of the judges says, even for the standards of the time, this is pretty incredulous. Mm -hmm. So you know, we we were looking at that as well as saying, well, no, we've always said Diplock was a rotten system, mm -hmm. and this is proof, proof. And so it was good. It was, it was nice, and it was good. My, my, we brought my children up. They were young, but they were we brought them up to the court for the day and. Mm -hmm. And they enjoyed it. And Joe, now Joe was Joe was my junior barrister. <laughs> well, you got, got comp you got compensation for the years. Eventually, we had to fight again. It's the British give you nothing for nothing. So we were cleared in two thousand and seven. We put in for compensation, and the British refused it because I don't know if you under, you know the way it used to work with miscarriage of justice. They had a thing called the ex gratia scheme. Where they didn't actually admit it was what the Birmingham sex benefit from the Guildford work. They didn't actually admit anything. They mm -hmm. just give you a little mm -hmm. money. It just says, mm -hmm. "Here's we're giving you X amount of money," but we're not actually saying no, we're wrong, or we did anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so the European, as far as I know, the European Convention of Human Rights says this was contrary to all sorts of rules. So they, they said you have to put in place proper procedures for this. So typical of British, they put in place procedures that makes it even harder to get compensation. Mm -hmm. And the one thing they say there should be the innocence. Now, if you know anything about the courts, the Court of Appeal will never use the word innocent. It's, it's just not a, it's not a question. They, it's a question of was your trial conducted satisfactorily? Yes mm -hmm. or no? Mm -hmm. But they'll never say, oh, you're, so therefore it was nearly impossible to get the compensation. So the British refused this compensation again, and then right through, then we took uh, a judicial review and the first judge actually says that he thought, you know, we should get it, but the way the law stood, we couldn't. So then we took a judicial review in front of Declan Morgan and the Court of Appeal, and we went up the Court of Appeal, and we lost there again. Did that cost you a lot of money to do those appeals? Or you... was, well, we were very lucky. We had great legal people, who the likes of Joe and the rest, who all worked for nothing. Really? Yeah. They worked on the basis that you know, if we won, they could pay it. If we yeah. lost... But that didn't uh, take away the fact that I think at one stage we would have been 150,000 in terms of the prosecution costs. But we didn't worry about that. So what you see, the, the art we have to be. I mean, I can't praise them enough. All of them worked for no fee. They all worked. They understand that there might be anything at the end of this, but they all did it anyway. I had, I say, Joe and with Elish McDermott, we had Kieran Malm, and he dropped out with a barrister Donald Sayers. I had uh, John Larkin then took over after. Michael Mansfield, John Larkin, who later became Attorney General. Yeah. And uh, then he had to stop because he became Attorney General and the, the DUP wouldn't let him continue. Where he asked, could, could he continue our case to conclusion? And they said no. So I had to get a, another senior bar. I got um, John O'Hara, who's now a, a High Court judge. And so they were all working the understanding. I think Joe tells a very funny story about approaching John O'Hara, saying, I've got a great case you might want to get involved in. And Joe explained to me, he said, ah, that sounds like a great case. And Joe says, there's only one problem. <laughs> You're not getting paid unless they win. <laughs> but John O'Hara says, no problem. <laughs> so we <laughs> took it to the court of appeal here and lost. And when Declan Morgan, the most he came out, would say, these men might not have been convicted. That was the first he would go, mm -hmm. which was actually described by some of as a bit of a cowardly judgment because, you know, like the evidence were, and I think he knew the evidence. But, so then we got leave to appeal to the Supreme Court. And in 2011, that hearing was held in the Supreme Court. It was Eilish McDermott and uh, John O'Hara and Joe Brawley and Donald Sayers. And 
that was I think again February 2011, and it was uh, May we got word that uh, we had won. So they they were going to compensate us, but again, like anything else, I mean, it took years and years and years, you know, and they give it to you in dribs and drabs, and they don't like you know when people think they just hand you a check for here you go, doesn't work like that. So we eventually could compensate it. Yeah, yeah. Satisfaction in that, I guess. Well, there's a certain degree. I mean, they were, again, they're pretty tight. They don't yeah. believe in giving you too much money if they can help it. But you know, <laughs> yeah. there, there's the, the satisfaction of the principal. I mean, mm. my point was that, you know, if you're if you in prison when you shouldn't be in prison, you should, you should be entitled mm. to compensation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned uh, Raymond McCartney. Now, when Raymond McCartney came out, uh, I'm not sure when he came out, but he's been involved in politics very actively. You, you chose not to be, I think. No, I, I, no I, that was a conscious choice when I came out. I just thought, no, I'll not bother. No, I, I'll not, I'll not join Sinn Féin even. I'll just, I'll do me. I mean, I'm still a Republican. I always mm -hmm. will be able to do the day of day. Mm -hmm. But I just, that was a conscious choice not to get involved in party politics. And I, Raymond I, did. I, was that why? Why was that? Um, I mean, that was in a way that was contrary to where you lived your life from 15 well, 16 it, year old. It was and it wasn't. Uh, I mean, not getting involved in party politics was a constant choice. I just thought I'm gonna live a life now for a way without having that constant thing of politics. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd, I'd met the woman who's now my wife, and so we were in a relationship at this stage, we were talking about getting married. I thought I'll just have a life for a way. Mm -hmm. My politics wouldn't have changed in the sense I'd still would have been a Republican. I still would have. Then when I became a journalist, I mean, I could do what I thought would benefit the Republicans mm -hmm. as well. You know, and bring a sort of a new point of view. So mm -hmm. there's various ways of doing it. I mean, just I, it was a conscious thing not to get involved with Sinn Féin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to my final point, um, Eamon. Uh, Sinn Féin, I only became aware of this consciously over the last couple of months. Um, they really have had a huge loss of voters. Uh, whoever it was, was it, um, went for, was it the MP went for uh, a seat and lost by 17,000 votes? Yeah, Alicia, Alicia McCallion. Alicia McCallion lost, yeah. yeah, she 17, lost by 17,000. How much did she win by when she got it in the first place? I think it was a couple of hundred. Oh. Now she got about she got about eighteen thousand votes when she won it. Oh. So then she dropped down to about nine thousand votes. Uh, no, but even but Colmese was vote I think was bigger than anything that John Hume got. Really? So yeah. I don't think John Hume ever got that a majority of that size. He always won. You'd always guarantee oh, oh. one, but yeah, uh, I don't really? think he ever got a majority of that size. So uh, I stand to be correct that if some number head wants to come yeah. along and tell, <laughs> yeah. So are you saying that they, it has something to do with the popularity of Colm Eastwood that led to that victory and uh, that loss of Sinn Féin? No, I don't think so. I think there's been a problem in Derry for some time with the Sinn Féin votes. Now, Derry, I mean, Derry, I mean, Derry's never been a major Republican city. It's been a national city. It's yes. always been a national city. Mm. It, was never, it wasn't always a Republican city. And the Sinn no. Féin vote in Derry was always around 10, 12,000. Mm -hmm. That's why they could never take the seats. Mm -hmm. In the surge of 2017, when Sinn Féin vote went up everywhere, they took the seats. It was after Martin McGuinness's resignation yeah. and all the rest, mm -hmm. and they took the seat then. But that was an aberration. But to lose it to such a, an extent then was quite a shock. I mean, I wasn't expecting it. We all thought it would be close. But you see, on the signs were there. They lost four seats or five seats at the council election previous yes. to that. <laughs> So the signs were there that the vote in Derry, there was a problem in Derry. But in, 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 all over Ireland, uh, Sinn Féin lost in council elections before the big surge that they had. The general the election, general yeah. election. Uh, they did. They lost badly down south. I mean, and that's yeah. one of the funniest things I was saying. Um, myself and Raymond would meet regularly. Like, still were, you know, we've been through that much together. We're still friends. And we were talking just before the southern general election about what would be a good outcome for Sinn Féin. We said, well, if only lose one or two seats, <laughs> that would be a good outcome. On, like, we, we're not expecting that. But no, it was, you, as you say, they lost a lot badly in the council elections and then came back. But this, there was discontent in Derry. There's, I mean, I think there was discontent with the party machine. There was a bit of complacency set in with Sinn Féin. 
you didn't see them at the start. They were always there. You always saw Sinn Féin on the streets at various things. You weren't seeing them as much. They had taken their voters for granted. Then there was talk of jobs for the boys and girls, you know, the, the certain groups. If Sinn Féin didn't give you the, their sanction, you weren't getting the job there. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of thing about that. So I think a combination of those factors, although I still think it's very drastic what Sinn Féin have done. Yeah, I think it's, it cost them. Well, I suppose it's based on the notion that, um, you know, you clear out the, the stables completely and don't show any, you know, I'm not doing any half measures here. Uh, and this will be exemplary of the, well, to be honest with you, I think of, I think of Barry Michael Duff when I think of it. You know, Barry yeah. Michael Duff, I think virtually everybody in Sinn Féin would have known that Barry Michael Duff wasn't sectarian. No, he, no, got, was... he got cut loose at the same time. Yeah, but I mean, but the danger is, I mean, Barry Michael Duff, they were able to seamlessly sort of transition into the next, yeah. and I think it's Orla Begley is the MP yeah, now. Yeah, the problem in Derry is, who takes over? Mm, mm. There is nobody, I mean, and I would have my pop finger on the pulse here and would be around the society in Derry. Mm. And it's very hard to see who there's gonna, they're going to put mm. forward to mm. take the places of Martina and Mm-hmm. and Karen Mullen and who they're going to run on the Westminster election and whatever that may be. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. It's very hard to see. Mm-hmm. And so a clean out is one thing, but you know, you've got to, if, if you're at the end of it, you don't come in a better position. Mm. It's a very risky strategy. Uh, so it might get worse before it gets better. Yeah, it could. But it'd be a, lo- a long time. Somebody was saying the generation before it would get better. Was that you maybe or somebody else said that? No, it wasn't me. I don't think it was me anyway. <laughs> I might saw you um, on the TV, I think, and she said... Yeah, it was, I was... But no, I just think it's, you know, without having a clear successor, I mean, that's the one thing with Sinn Féin. We're always so well organised mm. that as soon as one person was standing down, they had the successor in place. Mm. And, you know, it was almost seamless. Mm-hmm. It's not like that now. I mean, mm-hmm. Nobody can think of who's going to run. There's speculation about Faker McGuinness. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know why he wants to do it or... Mm-hmm. Uh, but who else? I mean, mm-hmm. there's there's no na- obvious name jumping out at you and saying, right, mm-hmm. you know, where's the the new the new broom? And yeah, yeah. So looking at, at the state situation of politics and Republican politics in Derry at the moment, um, looking at your life generally, uh, do you feel uh, disillusioned to a degree, or do you feel the sacrifices you made and the life you led? was worth it for the gains that have been made throughout Ireland? Well, I I was going to say, you didn't actually get involved in the conflict so that you could have politicians elected anyway. I think you wanted something more than that. No, there there was never, uh, it was never our goal. Mm -hmm. We were actually quite contentious of elected Mm -hmm. politicians and things in the early days. But no, um, hardly answer that question. I mean, I'm not, uh, you look, the overall goal, and the overall goal is United Ireland. Mm. And mm. I would think that that's probably now closer now than it's ever been. Mm-hmm. And you can't take away the, the, I mean, people try and dismiss the Republican struggle, the conflict, the, the war, as not contributing anything, but I think it has contributed totally. Yeah. totally no. With no war, we would not be anywhere near here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so I think that, so my, trying to look at it the long picture, no, as you say, I didn't go to jail so Sinn Féin could have the minister of whatever they have at the minute. Mm-hmm. But that's not what it was about. If you had said to me when I was in jail, would you want the storm it returned with Sinn Féin thing? We're never no chance. But if ultimately the, the end goal is reached the United Ireland, which I think is quite close now with uh, Brexit and mm-hmm. all the rest, fine. And it's been worth it. And so if, it would, if, 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 you, if it doesn't work out that way, over the next 10 oh. years, say? Well, it's still, it's happened. I mean, it's, you're still, we're a lot further forward now than we were. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe not as far forward as we, I'd like to be, or maybe not, as, as I say, not what the struggle was about, but you still have to say, the struggle has brought society forward, has brought the North forward. Mm-hmm. So if 10 years time, we still haven't got United Ireland, we'll still be working for it and still hoping that it's gonna, gonna come. And we'll say that this, the war played a part in bringing it near. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's terrific. Listen, thanks very much. I've, I've spoken to you for too long, but thank you very much. I'll just knock off this recording. Thank you. Right.